We are pleased to have Dr. Robert Marley, who is director of the Wind Energy Technology Office. He'll be giving the opening address. Dr. Marley um, is a 30-year veteran of the government senior executive service. Within DOE, he now, of course, is part of EERE, the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, but he's also worked in the Office of Science, Office of Policy, Office of Nuclear Energy, and Office of International Affairs. Bob, you really have been able to impact a, a lot of different areas. He also served as an officer in the US Navy Civil Engineering Corps. He holds a PhD in nuclear science and engineering from MIT, a licensed professional engineer in District of Columbia. He's also a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And I, I kind of like this last one too, an ambassador in DOE's Clean Energy Education and Empower Initiative designed to attract, retain, and advance careers of women in the field. So Bob, so glad to have you here. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you very much, Sue Ellen. I said, I'll wait for it to come up. But uh, let me just say while that's happening here, I think Mike Robinson is gonna do that, is that uh, I'd like to uh -huh. say good morning to everybody who's uh, uh, logged in here. It's uh, amazing that we have almost 100 folks and perhaps even more that are registered and will join later. And on behalf of the U.S. Department of Energy, I would just like to um, welcome everybody to the workshop. And many thanks to all of the organizers and the participants, um, particularly all of the panelists. I know it takes a lot of effort to organize one of these things. Uh, as we've seen, the uh, agenda there that Sue Ellen uh, put together, uh, really substantive topics. I uh, want to thank Sue Ellen for organizing it, but also Mike Robinson, all those in DOE that contributed, and also at NCAR. I would also like, um, before I begin this overview, to just thank all of you who are working in this field. Um, it is really a, a challenging endeavor, and as I reflect back on what I've learned here in the last, uh, what's happened over the last uh, five uh, years or more, uh, really a tremendous amount of remarkable progress, and it's really important uh, to the industry that this is uh, done well and that, uh, that these things uh, get in the hands of, uh, of people that can actually uh, uh, use them. Uh, our Assistant Secretary, uh, Daniel Simmons, uh, uh, often asks about uh, how we're doing uh, in A2E and uh, atmospheric science, and I always have some success stories to tell him. Uh, he's been out to uh, NREL several times and uh, been in the cave and uh, witnessed uh, all of the complex modeling and visualizations. Um, he also hears from industry about how important it is to understand this boundary layer between land and uh, a thousand meters up or so, and uh, and even more so in the new frontier in offshore. Uh, so uh, his only uh, command to me, direction to me, he says, Bob, make sure you get this in the hands of industry. So I hope that's a topic uh, that may be or a thread that can be woven through all the breakout sessions. Uh, how do we take what we know? Obviously, we have to, there's a lot more to know, but uh, and get it in the hands of uh, practical applications, tools, or whatever. And more about this later, and I'm sure Mike Derby will talk about it in the visioning of panel one. So uh, let me begin my presentation. It's very high level. Um, and I'll mention where I can, uh, where it touches on atmospheric science. So Mike, if you would advance me to the next slide. All right, so uh, this really is high level, but uh, there's a tremendous amount of uh, good news in the U.S. wind energy picture. Uh, you know, at, uh, it's uh, growing at 15% per year uh, on land and uh, I believe that the record uh, for 2019 was uh, over 7.3 or 7.4 percent of all the power produced in the United States uh, uh, came from wind power. Uh, and uh, we're now at 110 gigawatts and growing, and that's expected to uh, grow quite a bit before the uh, end of this calendar year. Uh, and uh, the resources, as you can see in that picture on the right, uh, you know, are vast. <laughs> I think if you... Uh, 
if you uh, kind of look at what's technically uh, achievable, it's uh, more than 10 times the power that's used in the United States. Uh, and uh, that's just onshore. And uh, the darkest areas of blue are offshore. And I'm told that uh, some of the best resources in the entire world are located up there in the uh, in the north uh, northwest uh, off the coast of Northern California, Oregon, and Washington. Uh, and uh, we're also doing uh, a lot of work up in uh, New England there. So uh, onshore is a fantastic story. Offshore is our new frontier. Uh, and I'll talk more about costs. Uh, talking over here on the left-hand side is that every one of those red dots uh, represents uh, a, uh, an economic entity that is uh, producing value uh, based on the wind industry. These are uh, wind related manufacturing facilities in the supply chain. Uh, basically, uh -huh. it's uh, distributed throughout the United States. And even though we don't have too much uh, wind actually in the Southeast, is that there's a tremendous amount of economic activity down there. So these are all good news stories. Uh, but uh, the thing here is that uh, there's some really serious challenges that remain, which is really still the focus of the department's uh, wind energy R&D program. Uh, our unsubsidized cost, uh, of course, we have the production tax credit, which is being phased out. Um, but, uh, you know, we want to compete uh, with no subsidy, and we're getting very close to that. Uh, still too high in, in some application areas. Um, and, uh, you know, the... The, the deep water offshore uh, is, uh, is a whole new uh, frontier for technology, and I'm not sure anybody's landed on the perfect design. Uh, we're very much into understanding what's going off there, going on out there, and what we need to do. And uh, obviously, there's a lot of work in atmospheric sciences to uh, both characterize the resources as well as to understand that uh, rather new uh, idea of this uh, boundary layer between the ocean. Uh, and the atmosphere. And everywhere you look, uh, there are always constraints uh, from environmental concerns and siting. Uh, I can mention some of those later. And uh, and then we uh, are dealing now with the fact that wind is no longer a novelty. It's a really main supplier of, uh, of, uh, of energy to our national grid. And uh, we need not just to understand how it integrates smoothly, but how it actually can uh, help uh, uh, shape of reliable, resilient, and uh, high-quality power source uh, in supporting grid through a lot of electronics. So uh, next slide, please. I would be remiss if I didn't at least touch briefly uh, on some of our past accomplishments. And uh, you can read these for yourself. Is that uh, on the bullets on the left, is that uh, a lot of patents. And uh, we did a lot of work uh, originally there in airfoil and blade designs. Uh, the picture behind Sue's uh, background is how it used to be. <laughs> Obviously, we've come a long way uh, since those uh, farm windmills and raising water for irrigation uh, and uh, tremendous advances in atmospheric science, uh, uh, wind turbine and uh, wind plant interactions, code development and model validation. Uh, so uh, tremendous and in, in industries using them. Uh, We've done a, made a lot of progress on land-based and offshore cost reductions over time. You can see the charts on the right, uh, about a 50% reduction since just in the last 10 years in the uh, levelized cost of energy uh, from uh, you know way up there around uh, eight or nine cents uh, per kilowatt hour, uh, now down to something under four. Uh, but our goal is, is that we feel we really have to cut that in half once again and get down into the two cent range. And on offshore is that we've gone from almost 25 cents a kilowatt hour uh, down to something under 10, uh, another 50% reduction plus. And, uh, but our goal is to keep going and uh, try to get from uh, 10 down to five. So those are our long-term cost reduction goals. Um, I think those are set for 2030. Uh, yeah, at the bottom there, and uh, and then I also have some for uh, distributed wind, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Next slide, please. So the Department of Energy gets its money, of course, from appropriations in Congress. Uh, we're very grateful for the support that we have among the appropriators and the constituent and, and the members, both in the Senate and the House, uh, and they give us uh, about a hundred million dollars a year. That's uh, our budget for uh, fiscal year 20. Uh, we're looking at something in the marks, uh, basically on a levelized basis for the future. And uh, But they also give us a lot of direction on how to spend it. 
and uh, this is how they organize uh, our funding, and so this is how we have to respond. Uh, it's organized by offshore wind, land-based wind, distributed wind, systems integration, which includes uh -huh. that work on the grid that I mentioned, and then data modeling and analysis. And our top line priorities uh, thematically across all of those uh, areas is basically uh, technology advancement and uh, aggressive cost reduction. We feel like if we can get the cost down through innovation, uh, the industry can do the rest. And uh, that involves scaling and lightweighting, particularly as we get bigger and bigger with economies of scale and, uh, and hit the challenges offshore. And then, of course, uh, the environmental and siting challenges, we have to uh, address those with the knowledge and information and uh, modeling and uh, some technology uh, just for informing what it is that we're doing and also workarounds. Uh, Europeans have made a lot of progress in some areas, uh, and so have we on uh, deterrence. And you can see a bird. I think that's probably, given the size of the turbine, that's probably a large bird. <laughs> I would say an eagle. And uh, and uh, we really want uh -huh. to uh, uh, counteract uh, uh, some of the comments that I've seen in the press that uh, uh, I even heard this morning on NPR radio, uh, somebody's view that wind turbines uh, uh, were graveyards for birds. And uh, we're definitely trying to work uh, work on that aspect. And then grid services. It's a nice picture there. It's a drawing, I think, courtesy of NREL in the top of uh, six different types of uh, offshore wind. Uh, it kind of emphasizes the fact that 50% of our budget uh, in, in fiscal year 20 was uh, focused on offshore wind and uh, the new frontiers there. Next slide, please. So offshore wind, and you're going to get one slide per, per uh, area here, so five of these uh, are coming up, and that's about the end of my presentation, so I'll keep moving as fast as I can. Uh, the challenges, uh, I mentioned, there's still cost reduction, uh, and, uh, and uh, in fixed bottom, we can learn an awful lot from the Europeans, which have made progress over really over two decades. Uh, but we have a lot of unique aspects in the United States uh, uh, dealing with the hurricanes and the, and the high force winds and, and uh, icing in some of the lakes and uh, uh, deep water. Uh, Europeans have to, the benefit of a, a kind of a continental shelf there that's very shallow, uh, mostly. I mean, the North Sea is obviously deeper, but uh, uh, and off of Spain. But, uh, uh, you know, that's where a lot of progress has been on fixed bottom. Um, but, uh, you know, and they've made a, a lot of advances in, in wildlife protection in accommodating uh, radar for navigation and weather and, and things like that. And uh, there are uh, ways of uh, addressing some of the concerns we're getting from, uh, uh, from NOAA and from, uh, uh, from the Defense Department and, uh, and things like that. And there are always community impacts where information uh, very much helps and we can provide that knowledge. Uh, and then uh, obviously we're trying to optimize the production of uh, wind power from, from uh, offshore fixed bottom. And uh, that really goes to the heart of what you're doing in terms of how to forecast the weather and uh, optimize plant operation and uh, avoid wake effects and things like this. In the floating uh, area offshore, uh, the priorities are, uh, you know, what is the uh, best platform for, for each area and uh, how does that work, uh, how to bring the power ashore. Uh, and uh, uh, these things are very expensive to demonstrate, so obviously we'd like to try to simulate them if possible. Uh, and uh, because uh, really, I'd like to be very creative in terms of all the innovative designs. Uh, there are probably more than two dozen that I've seen on how to do this, and uh, obviously we don't have the money to do 2020 uh, demonstrations. Uh, and so modeling and simulation would really help in that uh, respect. And then we have this uh, thing that uh, we call the marine air boundary layer characterization. Uh, uh, Mabel, if you will, is that uh, uh, kind of uh, where I think Mike Derby will indicate uh, A2E might be heading is uh, uh, with the offshore emphasis and a lot of concentration of our appropriations in that direction. We need to, to, to move to understanding uh, uh, that regime and cross-cutting R&D everywhere, both uh, 
uh, fixed bottom floating. Uh, you know, if you're going to really go to economies of scale, you're talking about ultra large turbines. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, 10 megawatts, uh, 12, uh, 14, <laughs> those are really big turbines. Uh, you know, the nacelles on those things look like uh, small European hotels. I mean, they are gigantic. Uh, the blades that we're testing in Massachusetts uh, are longer than a football field, including the end zones. Uh, and, uh, you know, so you say, how do you get any larger than that? Well, uh, there's still economies of scale if we can do it. So we're thinking on the drawing board about uh, something even larger. And uh, obviously, we need to understand uh, how that's going to react, all the forces and the fatigue and everything else uh, with the atmosphere. And uh, offshore is very expensive to do. Obviously, you have to have people out there to uh, uh, do inspection, et cetera. We'd like to see if we can use, uh, make use of automation and drones, and uh, not just for inspection, but uh, also possibly repair. Next slide, please. So on land-based wind, is that uh, even though we've had a tremendous amount of success, is that uh, we're still looking at ways to innovate and compete without subsidy. To do that, uh, we feel like we need to cut costs uh, even by another 50%, get down to uh, two cents uh, per kilowatt hour if possible. And uh, an awful lot of uh, work needs to go into uh, uh, just addressing uh, uh, reasonably, acceptably uh, uh, some of the constraints that are impacting uh, uh, wind energy development on land. Uh, obviously, uh, as you go taller and bigger, is that uh, we need to get lighter and more flexible. Uh, the stress stresses are just uh, and weights, are just the mass of these things uh, uh, create constraints. And uh, we have issues with uh, uh, manufacturing, maybe uh, uh, artificial intelligence or automation that might get some of the labor out of the blade and, uh, and address some of the logistics innovation. If you've got a blade that's over a football field in length, uh, you're going to have to figure out how to get it to the site. And uh, that itself is a huge challenge. So, uh, you know, talking about segmentation and all the kinds of things that go into understanding material stresses and joining um, new materials. Uh, plant optimization, uh, wind resource science to better predict and optimize performance. Uh, this is uh, right in uh, your remit, uh, and uh, we need to inform the design with the uh, knowledge uh, that we produce uh, from that science, uh, which has impacts on financing and grid integration. Uh, the grid wants to know uh, what the power is going to be, and perhaps with uh, your tools you can uh, offer predictions that are reliable. Uh, and uh, controls to use waste effect, uh, the way these things conflict with each other. And then the environmental exciting uh, priority I've mentioned already. Uh, we're talking about all kinds of wildlife offshore. Uh, it's not just uh, birds and bats and migratory species uh, in the air, but it's also uh, the wildlife in the sea and the ecosystems that are disturbed maybe by uh, development or sound and uh, and moorings and things like that. So uh, it's, it's really uh, quite a big field uh, altogether to address all of these things in a, in a way that's going to allow the industry to move ahead uh, responsibly. Uh, next slide, please. A distributed wind uh, used to be called small wind uh, because uh, we're looking at turbines there kind of in the lower right-hand side there where these things are, are basically at 10 and 15 uh, uh, kilowatts, <laughs> uh, you know, and they're located, uh, you know, on, uh, in, in remote areas uh, off-grid. And that's no longer the case now. Distributed wind uh, also has uh, turbines that are even larger than one megawatt, and uh, they're being placed now on industrial campuses uh, in all kinds of locations, and not just uh, single towers, but in clusters of, uh, of a half a dozen or more. And uh, But all of this, of course, is behind the meter, and so uh, there's a lot of uh, challenges there with uh, how do you create those interfaces so that every single one of them is not a one-off design, which can be very expensive for the developers and so and we're working on uh, uh, you know hybrid and microgrid systems we got a really cool example going on at the flat arms campus right now at uh, at nrel uh, where we had uh, a disruption from the power grid uh, with a uh, transformer failure and uh, they've been operating for uh, a number of weeks now off grid and it's just amazing when you crank up the solar panels the wind turbines uh, the batteries uh, of all the things that are there, including a backup generator, I think the latest news this weekend was that we went 29 hours straight 
uh, with uh, 100, 100% renewable energy uh, on the uh, microgrid. So microgrids is another area where, uh, where we're doing a lot of work. I think the chairman of FERC actually toured the site this last weekend and was extremely impressed by uh, what we're doing out there, kind of on the cutting edge of microgrids. Uh, so, uh, yeah, an affordable, accurate resource assessment. Uh, really need to know everything we can possibly know about uh, what that resources is and uh, and how it performs and uh, what you can get out of it. Uh, obviously, uh, the whole business case of putting something out in the water uh, or in a small. This we're talking about distributed wind here. Is that uh, a lot of times the resolution is just not fine enough for them to make a, a good resource assessment. They can look at a big map, but they don't really know uh, on their property, uh, you know, what it's like. And so, uh, you know, getting finer resolution here for uh, those kind of applications is helpful. Uh, next slide, please. On systems integration, I've probably already. Uh, giving you enough clues as to where we're going on this. Uh, but yes, we're making some major investments in the Flatirons campus as a uh, as a grid platform. It's called now ARIES, uh, Advanced Research, Research for uh, uh, Integrated Energy Systems. And, uh, and we're, uh, and I think 10% of our budget out of Congress is uh, focused uh, on grid integration. Next slide, please. And I think I'm concluding here with uh, Data and analysis is that uh, if you look at my graphs over there on the right hand side is that uh, if we uh, look at the top uh, chart and the gold line there, uh, that's what happens uh, if uh, we don't reduce uh, the cost of energy much after uh, where we are today. We kind of plateau and uh, the gold line uh, on the bottom chart is the scenario uh, where wind would go uh, if we were on that path. And it really is pretty much uh, plateaued there at about 100 gigawatts. Uh, we don't really make much progress if we stay the same, particularly without the production tax credit, which is uh, phasing out. However, if you could get on that green line, which is the uh, kind of the most optimistic scenario, and we can reduce the uh, cost of energy by another 50 or 60 percent, is that uh, then the green line just takes off, uh, where it's almost exponential in terms of growth uh, between now and 2050, where it uh, goes uh, from uh, 100 gigawatts, uh, you know, up to something on the order of 500 or 600 gigawatts, which would um, be a really large portion of the nation's energy supply. So these kind of analysis uh, kind of suggest where we. <coughs> need to go and what would happen if we didn't get there and what are the highest priorities and best pathways for investment on R&D and we're very grateful to all the people who are contributing to uh, the data analysis and modeling uh, thrust of our portfolio. And the last slide I think is on STEM education. Yeah, we, uh, we note that uh, in the wind industry, the uh, uh, wind technician, <coughs> excuse me, is uh, apparently the highest growing job category in the United States. <laughs> it's growing in demand at 15% per year. It has for a long time. Uh, and uh, so there's a, a big demand uh, for uh, getting kids exposed to uh, the wind industry as a career field. There's all kinds of jobs. You don't have to climb a tower to get a job. Is it? <laughs> you can do <coughs> work in the modeling area, work in the business and finance, work in the regulatory compliance. Uh, there are all kinds of dimensions to the wind industry. It's really a, a robust a hiring opportunity. And uh, we have programs here called Wind for Schools and also the Collegiate Wind Competition, uh, which is uh, uh, orchestrated by NREL. Uh, we usually award uh, uh, a dozen colleges and universities through a competition uh, to bring their kids uh, through a program to actually design wind turbines, operate them in our, uh, in our uh, uh, test facility. Uh, wind tunnel and uh, check their performance uh -huh. and uh, and then also do a project design and make presentations. This last year was really a challenge uh, with uh, all of the COVID and the schools shutting down, but it's just amazing uh, how determined these kids were to uh, do a good job. And uh, wherever they were, uh, they did a fantastic job in the end, uh, uh, bringing all their teamwork together after a year and making great presentations and uh, and uh, being introduced actually to a lot of you who are doing hiring. Uh, so uh, many thanks to you who, who uh, basically uh, follow the program and uh, take an interest uh, in the young people who are coming up the line. 
I think that's where I will end. Uh, and thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you so much, Bob. We're so pleased and honored to have you here to tell us about the wind energy technology program.